Father God, thank you for this opportunity we have to now come and worship you. We've been worshiping you since we got up today. Yes. So Father, we're so thankful that you are with us. You promise to never leave us. You promise to never forsake us. You promise to be there even in the hard times. And even in the easy times. You will never, ever, ever abandon us. So this morning as we come into a time of, of, of worshiping you, Lord, we pray you be seated. Let us be a sweet sound in your ear and a sweet smell in your mouth. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Pray that becomes revelation. That you are Lord Jesus. Death couldn't hold you down. I pray that it becomes revelation by the power of the Spirit to reign in our lives and know that you are alive. They couldn't defeat you. They couldn't kill you. You are seated at the right hand of the Father when you intercede for them. I pray for fresh anointed revelation to know that you are alive and you live in us. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. He lives in us today. He lives in us tomorrow. He lives in us in the hardest times that we'll go through. But Lord, this morning we want revelation by the power of your Spirit. No matter how hard it gets, you are there. And we only get peace. And we only get joy because of what you've already done. You dwell in us, Lord. I pray for confirmation in each and every heart today, Lord. I pray, God, for each confirmation in every heart today, Lord, that you purchased us. Death has no power over us anymore. Let your name be glorified in everything we say, everything we do, that you be glorified in Jesus' name. You know, uh, his testimony Part of the memory of what my wife went through is she came out of the baptismal tank and she was going, because <laughs> the Spirit got a hold of her and she just began to speak in tongues and, and it, it, she had no power over it. Amen? Yeah. That's what the Spirit does. I mean, the Spirit does that, there's no faith in it. Amen? So, Interesting service this morning, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> it's the Lord. So, what do I do now? Praise God. Amen. You know, how many of you know what the term religiosity is? And a religious spirit. Right? Someone who has to have everything just the way it is, otherwise they won't fit. Amen. That religious spirit, religiosity, didn't come about from the scripture. Man created religiosity. Man created religion to, to speak of. In other words, the way man wants it done is the way man wants it done. Amen. Otherwise, we won't do it. Amen. Amen? But when the Spirit moves, we have to be obedient to keep our religiosity in the seat and let God do what He wants to do. Amen? You have people coming into a service, and I've seen this many, many times, coming into a service, and they'll um, come in for a few minutes and the worship will start or someone will pray and, oh, that ain't for me, you know me. Right? What are they missing by not allowing the Spirit to move on them because it's not going the way that they think it should go? It happens all the time, folks. People want things done the way they think it needs to be done. And if God doesn't understand that, too bad. <laughs> it's the truth, isn't it? There's people out there that want things to be done the way that they've done it all their lives, or 
look at this or look at that, and that's the way it's got to be done, otherwise it ain't real. But what they fail to realize is God might be the same yesterday, today, and forever, but He's new every day. So just because it's the way that you did it in your home church doesn't mean it's going to be like that everywhere. Or if you don't play certain kind of worship music, you're not in any. We're led by the Spirit here. I don't know if you've noticed that or not. Yeah. But we're led by the Spirit here. And the door is open to anybody <clears throat> that wants to walk through it. Amen? Amen? And the Lord has shown me and my wife years ago. All we're supposed and you've heard me say this a good many times, all we're supposed to do is preach the word and love the people. No matter who comes in that door. Our responsibility is to be true before Christ. Amen? All of us in this room. To be true before Christ. And there are people that will walk in, oh, that ain't my way on out. Well, you know what? Maybe the Lord will get a hold of you. You know what? We're all we're all guaranteed the Damascus Road experience. Right? I had one. Sound like Kim had one. Everybody in here has had a Damascus Road experience sometime. If you haven't, get ready. <laughs> Amen? Because I'll tell you what, if it wasn't for Damascus Road experience from Saul, the half of the New Testament wouldn't be here today. And his insights and his truth. Can you imagine how much and how many times the Spirit spoke to that guy. How long was he, when he first got saved, or when he first met Jesus, how long was he out in the wilderness? Just getting his stuff together. 13 years, they say. Sometimes they say 14. Can you imagine? Going through the learning process that Paul went through just to come back and do what God's asking him to do. Amen? Our situation today is to make sure that what we are doing is lining up with what we're told to do. Amen? There is nobody in this planet, nobody in this planet that can tell you you're doing it wrong. Or you're doing it right. Because that's God's responsibility to relay it through, through the, the Spirit to us. Amen? So, God's perfect timing. We mentioned a little bit about timing before, haven't we? God's perfect timing. God has his own sense of timing. Now, you know that. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. So some of us in here might have a few 999 days, years left. Right? Before our prayers are answered. He has perfect timing. I mean, we believe that. Does God have perfect timing? Yeah. We've heard a couple of times today. Would God work through you a year ago? God wants to do something in us now. But it's in his timing. The Bible says when you pray, if it's your will. If it's your will, Lord. Not, just like you said on the cross, not my will, your will. But sometimes we think because we're praying that it's automatically God's will. And God says, wait a minute, my timing. My timing. The Lord, my world's falling apart. Maybe it needs to fall apart. Maybe you need to lose everything. Maybe you need to be joyful and happy in what you don't have compared to what you have. Amen? God's perfect timing. He's never late and he's never early. What time, Lord, would you be early? No, my alarm clock is set for a certain time in your life and that's when it's going to go off. Amen? You know, there's some happy people in here today. I can see it. Amen? God is never in a hurry, but he's always on time. The Lord is sovereign over time. You read the, the, the book of Daniel and all of his visions and all the things he wrote down. 
God is sovereign over the future of every one of us. He's sovereign over the future of the entire human race, over the entire world. He is sovereign. The more we understand that he's in control of our life, I'm not going to say the easier it gets, but the more understanding you have towards your walk that you walk. Amen? We're looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, aren't we? Yeah. We're looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth. Sometimes we want it now. And God says, my time. Is God that big to you? Or is he just a few words on a page? God, you're not big enough. You can't do this for me because you haven't done it yet. The amazing thing to me, folks, is when it happens, oh yeah, I'm glad I waited and didn't go out and do something dumb. Right? And believe me, everyone in this room has done something dumb. You know how I know that? Because you're humans. You don't have perfect written across your forehead. Amen? But what do you do while you are waiting for God to do what he has promised to do? What do you do when you're waiting for God to fulfill a promise that he's promised you? Wait. Second Peter chapter 3. You don't have to turn there if you don't want. Just write it down. And we're going to go through the first 18 verses. Second Peter chapter 3. This is now, beloved, the second. You know what? If you think about Peter, you almost have to slap yourself in the head and go, this guy who denied his Lord and Savior three times because he was afraid that he's going to get found out and go through the same stuff his Lord was going three times? The worst thing to me was why we already know him. I don't even know him. But further on in the scriptures, you can see where Jesus asked him three questions. Basically saying, Peter, it's okay. Those three things don't matter to me no more. But will you feed my sheep? Will you feed my lambs? Will you feed my sheep? What was Peter's answer? You know I will, Lord. Would you also said that before you got confronted by the girl on the fire? Right? Now we have a letter from an individual who knows God, who is anointed by the Holy Spirit to write us things. This is now, beloved, the second letter I'm writing to you, which I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder. By way of reminder. I'm writing to you again to remind you of what we talked about in the first letter. That you should remember the words spoken beforehand by the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior spoken, spoken by your apostles. You need to remember what was spoken to you by those prophets of old and by what Jesus himself spoke to you. Now understand this for a second. He had a following, didn't he, Jesus? We hear about the twelve. We don't hear so much about the hundred that follow him around, but he had twelve and plus some others, right? So these twelve apostles are going around telling what Jesus is showing him, telling them, and you got people going, Oh man, what, what, how'd you get a hold of that lie? Or how'd you get a hold of that dumb thing? And then something happens in their life that says, Oh yeah, I remember Peter told me that. Or so and so from a group of then people told me that. This is what he says here. Knowing the first of all, that first of all, that in the last days mockers will come with their mocking, falling after their own lust. 
When you look at the evil in the world today, all the wars, environmental damage, violence, institutional torture, injustice, horrific crimes, and the amount of suffering, you might wonder why Jesus does not come back now and sort it all out. There's a timing. God's timing. How many people, you probably don't, you know, I don't know how many of us know people like this, but how many people have you heard about or know that are so sick and tired of waiting that they go back into the world? I'm not going to wait no more. This ain't going to happen. And that's what Peter's talking about here. You can't, you have to listen to the prophets. You have to listen to what the, the men of God spoke to you. You have to listen to what Jesus spoke to you. And don't worry about the naysayers. Oh, Jesus is supposed to come for 2,500 years. Well, it's his, his, his timing, not mine. And out of that comes all kinds of lies. All kinds of untruths to cause men to fall away from the truth. Next thing you know, they're involved in, in stuff that Originally, they would have never got involved in. But because God takes his time, I'm not going to wait no more. I'll tell you what, I'll wait until the house comes down. Amen? Amen? Why does God be led? Why has the Lord not returned already? Peter warned us. So look, at, look at verse 4. I'll read verse 3 again. Now this, first of all, that in the last days mockers will come with their mocking following after their own lust, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, our all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. Nothing's changed. As a matter of fact, things are worse. Things are worse. Peter warns us that people will mock us and say, so what's happening to the promise of the king? Where's the promise at? You might know someone in your life that was raised in a Christian home from a young person, watched their parents or grandparents walk with Christ for years and years and years, and now all of a sudden they're 17, 18, 19, 20 years old or whatever. Why am I doing this? My grandparents never seen it. My mom and dad never seen it. My older brother never seen it. My older sister. Why am I doing this? It's a lie from the pit of hell to get young people and adult people to say, well, it's not going to happen in a way, so why should I bother? Let me tell you something, folks. To live as Christ lives, it takes faith. It takes more faith than our humanosity. Is that a word? Uh, humanity is a word. That our, that our humanity will allow us to think about. I don't like that word. Don't ask me how to spell it. Yeah, you know. There's a good, very good reason for his delay. The reason that the Lord has not come already is to give people what a God we serve. To give people more time to repent. And what does the Bible say? How are they going to know unless someone tells them? Folks, there's so much stuff out there today. There's so much broadcasting. There's so much radio stuff. There's so much stuff out today that if you don't know the scriptures, you're going to head down the wrong road in a heart. I remember years ago there was a, a guy on TV that I forget his name now. He'd get on that TV and he he'd yell and he'd scream. You know, if you give me a thousand dollars, the Lord will give you five thousand dollars back. And if you if you if you benefit my ministry, the Lord's gonna do this, the Lord's gonna do that. That is not right. It's not right. When God prompts you to give, give. Amen. And when they end, we have responsibility to give two folks right away. Amen. But that doesn't mean we have to have someone trying to encourage us to give up everything we have because God's going to bless us with something that we don't have. That's not always true, is it? He 
says there is a very good reason. The reason is, the Lord wants more to repent. God is not in a hurry. Look with me at verse 5. For when, the ma- main, for when they maintain this, it escapes their notice that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and by water, through which the world at that time was destroyed, being flooded with water, but the present heavens and earth, by his word, are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. I don't know about you, but the world is full of ungodly men. And women. Verse 7. Verse 6. Though which the world at that time was destroyed, being flooded with water. But the present heavens and earth, by his word, are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. But do not let this one fact escape your notice, Beloved, that with the Lord one day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. Amen? He wants more and more and more and more and more people to come to him, no matter how long it takes. Because if if God's timing is that small, even though it's a long time to us, isn't it? We should be trying to bring people to Christ on a massive level because the time is short. Let me tell you something, folks. God's timing is set. Amen? Amen. So when the time comes for him to do what he says he's going to do, no time left. That's it. You missed the boat. Well, I got a few years. How do you know? How do you know? Well, I'll go home and ask the Lord in my heart later. How do you know? How do you know you won't walk out of your house in the morning and and get run over? You don't know. That's why we have a responsibility, folks, to love people enough to share them the offer of love. Amen? That doesn't mean they're going to come to Christ in your time. But if they don't hear, how are they going to know? Like Kim was saying, you know, she grew up with a horrible life. And she went to a church where the word was being preached and it got a hold of her. Amen? But that's the key, where the word is being preached. Everyone in this room is called to preach the word. Everyone. That doesn't mean you got to come up here and do whatever it is I'm doing. What it means is you have to present the gospel to anyone who has an ear to listen. Amen? God's not in a hurry. God is not being slow in keeping his promise. Rather, the delay comes from his patience. Have you ever asked God, thank you for your patience? Yes. Perfect. Perfect timing is God's resource for us to be patient and let him do a work in us as he chooses to do. Some slow, some fast. But in his timing, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repent. He wants everyone to come to repentance. Verse 9. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. You know, when I, when I first read that scripture, I said, Lord, patient with me. Patient with me. The Lord said, You, patient with you. Who are you talking to? Who are you talking to? Talking to you. That's who he's talking to. He's talking to you. Lord, let me be patient in your timing and still present the gospel. Sometimes when you share the gospel with somebody who's going through a horrific time and they don't get it, they don't accept Christ or whatever, your first response is to reach up and grab another shirt collar and shake the life out of them. No, I'll be praying for you. I'll be praying for you. 
Pretty soon someone else comes along, drops a few words in there. Next thing you know, the churches at a Southern Baptist church meeting get to glorify. Amen. Amen. That's how God works. We need to let him work. God isn't late with his promises as some major lateness. He is restraining himself on account of you. He's restraining himself on account of, on account of you. Holding back the end because he doesn't want anyone lost. You've heard people say, well, God, he's not a very good God if he's going to send people to hell. He's doing the best he can for you not to go to hell. He sent his son. He became, he he left heaven and became a man and dwelt among us so you could be set free from your sin, from death, from sickness. So the grave has no power over you, which it doesn't anyway. Because of Jesus. Aren't you glad he's not late with his promises? His lateness? His measure of lateness? Some of you in this room go, man, I've waited for this a long time. And things are beginning to change. Amen? He doesn't want anyone lost. Repentance is all about a change of direction in your life. Change is all about changing the direction. Repentance is all about change of direction in your life. You've heard this before. When you come to repentance, you turn 180 degrees around, right? Count my words, folks. You're going to hit a wall. And what you do when the wall comes up is where your strength's going to come. Lord, I rebuke this wall. This is no longer part of my life. This is no longer part of my thinking. Get behind me, Satan. And they go. How many times have you heard this this month? Count it all joy when you go through driver temptation and trouble. Because it produces an endurance. For the next time, yeah, for the next time. But God has promised never to leave you in the next time. Amen? Is it turning away from all the bad stuff and turning to Jesus? Now, some of us in this room <clears throat> might not understand the bad stuff as much as someone else in the room. Someone in the room, and I believe we're all this way, someone in the room has been through worse than you. Someone in this room has been through worse than you. Man, well, I think those things were bad. Because someone always went through worse, going through worse than the devil. But God's patient enough. He's lovingly holds the door open for your salvation. He interprets our master's plan in patient restraint for what is salvation. God is a patient restrainer of the end of the age. Amen. But he still has a clock on it. And when that clock makes this last tick or hourglass sand or whatever, amen. How many of you know that <clears throat> when you hear the word salvation, sometimes because of the way it was taught, misunderstood. Salvation doesn't mean much to anybody anymore. Salvation has become a cliche in a lot of different religiosity thinking. There's only one way to receive salvation. There's only one way to be set free from your sin and all your all your waywardness. There's only one way. And that's through the blood of Jesus. That's it. So whatever mockery other things have made about salvation by saying this or doing this or go plant this or whatever, that isn't it. God's timing is allowing people to come to salvation in his effort that none should be lost. I don't know about you, but sometimes, a lot of times, I'll think of Christ on the cross. And these words 
forgive them, Father. For they don't know what they're doing. When you and I will probably start being saved hanging on the cross. But Jesus, forgive them, Father. Yeah, they're putting me to death. They're stoning me. They're jabbing me in the side. They got this crown of thorns on my head. They're, they're causing my, my side to bleed with water. But forgive them. You almost have to ask yourself how many people at that cross, other than the soldier, oh, that must be the Son of God. How many people at that cross at that time, at that moment, realized that Jesus is the only way and actually sought out someone to share the gospel of Christ with them? The Bible doesn't say much, does it? But you know it had to happen. You know it had to happen. Forgive them, Father, they don't know what they're doing. Father, God, why have you turned your face from me? God, why have you turned the other direction? Do you, do you remember who I am? Why, why are you looking away? God cannot look upon sin. And Jesus became our sin on that cross. God could look. But when Jesus said, it is finished, Father God said, come on, one son. Your job is done. Once he went into the hell and the grave, conquered the devil, took the keys of life and death and ascended to the Father, it is God is a God of timing, and his timing is right now. But we can't look at the timing. We have to understand that we're living in a time that's almost done. So we have to put our, our understanding in high gear to try to bring as many with us as we can. Amen? The theme of salvation is one of the great themes of Paul's letter. You read Paul's letters and it's all about come to Jesus. This, he did this and he did this for you. He did this for you. God's timing is allowing people to come to the saving knowledge of their Savior, Jesus the Christ. Look at verse 16. <clears throat> No, wait a minute. Let me go up here. Sin, verse 11. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? Looking for a hastening, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, on account of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning, and the elements will melt with intense heat. But according to his promise, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, spotless and blameless. Ephesians tells us in chapter 5 that God, Christ is coming back for a church, his bride, free from spot or wrinkle. Which means what? You're walking in righteousness. You're walking in holiness. Now Paul tells us there's none righteous, no, not one. But that doesn't mean we can't strive for it. Amen? Paul, Peter demonstrates here that the early church and apostles understood the New Testament writings as having the same divinity authority, divine authority, as those of the Old Testament. There's no division between old and new. People think there is, but there isn't. We have the same ability, the same teaching, the same power, the same authority as those great prophets of old did. The big difference is this, folks. When the Spirit showed up in the Old Testament, He lived in us after Christ sent Him to us. 
We don't have to conjure him up. He's there. We don't have to wait for him to give us a vision of, 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 of sheepskin dry and once wet. We don't have to wait for that. Because he dwells in us. The Lord will come at his time. And when we don't expect it, like a thief in the night, the world as we know it will be made bare. There will be a new heaven and a new earth. He's coming for his church. The New Testament vision of the future is not so much of people going up to heaven, rather it is that there will be a new heaven and a new earth. Amen? God's going to renew everything. That can bring you fear, can't it? Prophets of old, Revelation, Daniel, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, all of them talked about a time when the earth will be destroyed and then will come. That doesn't necessarily mean God's going to take the planet and blow it up. Okay? But as long as we're walking after Him and understanding Him, we will have no fear. We are called to a new heaven and a new earth. Amen? Peter points out that God is faithful to His word and His promises. Look at verse 2. That you should remember the words spoken beforehand by the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior spoken by your apostles. Verse 5, For when they maintain this, it escapes their notice that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and by water. Verse 7, But the present heavens and earth by his word are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. Verse 9 says this, The Lord is slow, is not slow about his promises, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. And verse 13, but according to his promise, we are looking for a new heaven and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. There's, no, there's not much righteousness out there in that earth. That's why we are called to walk in righteousness. The Bible says, be ye holy to my holy. How can, I, how can I be holy? You're not going to match God's holiness, right? But you can walk to, to strive after being holy while you're here in this sin infested world. And what does that mean to be holy here? What you think, what you see, what you do, what you read, what you look at on TV, that's all contributing to your holiness or your anti holiness. When you let things get into your spirit, it has a way of working on your holiness. It has a way of working on your righteousness. And then you begin to hear the lines of the truth. God's timing. God's timing. Grace, as we all know, is undeserved love. You grow in grace as you turn to the Lord, dependent on Him in every situation you face. How many in this room can honestly say what it means to depend on someone when you're going through something? Or someone there in your life who's going to actually depend on someone to keep you going, to bring you up out of this, and help you get through it. God's promised to be there for you. He's promised as you go through stuff to be there for you. When's it going to end? It's going to end in His timing. His perfect. Bringing your needs to him day by day as you eagerly expect his return. Bring your needs to him day by day. Bring your desires to him day by day. Bring your failures to him day by day. Because in his perfect timing and by his power and his authority, you will go through it to the other side. You will be an overcomer. We've heard testimonies today. Testimonies, as the Lord tells us, is that's where our power comes from. Is the power of our testimony sometimes makes people wake up to the fact, you know what, I got one of those. I got one of those. We are overcomers by the blood of the Lamb and the power of our testimony. In his perfect time. Amen. So if you're going through something today that might cause you to turn left or turn right when you should go straight, 
You let the Lord, by the power of the Spirit, direct your path. Amen? Amen. Because the enemy wants to take you down the wrong road. Amen. Jesus did not tell us the road off to, to, to paradise is narrow, and the road off to hell is wide for no reason. There's a reason for that. Father God, thank you for today. Thank you for the new testimony. Thank you, Lord, that we can glorify you in everything that we say and do because you are working. Thank you for your word that's alive, that's quick, and sharper than any two edged sword, pierces between the divine, divides between soul and spirit. We thank you this morning, Lord, that you are with us. You promised to never leave us, Lord, with us. You are the same every day, but yet you're new every morning. Help us never to forget that we are walking in your time. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord.